To help us talk a little bit more about image processing algorithms, we're going to use a non-standard toolkit called the Images Package. It's a set of classes that were developed by Martin Osborne and Ken Lambert, and uh, essentially it makes it really easy, really straightforward to do simple things like loading image from a file, viewing the image, changing pixels where we want to, you know, updating the window so we can see what the changes did, and then finally saving the image back to file. It's called images, and uh, you know, th this is not a widely used package of classes, you know, throughout the Java developer universe, but for our purposes, which is to learn about object-oriented programming and to do some basic image processing, it's going to do what we need it to do. The two most important classes in the images package are the AP image class and the pixel classes. Okay, so the, the, the pixel class, uh, it, it defines a single pixel. So it's how we represent a particular pixel. We'll make an instance of the pixel class. And you can see some of the methods that we have in the pixel class here. Well, first of all, uh, a pixel class has three int values, and each of those represents red or green or blue. And then we have a, a bunch of different methods. We'll, we'll go through them in detail later. But for now, uh, you can see them listed here. The other really important one is the AP image class. And an AP image is the object we'll use to represent an entire image. Uh, it's essentially just a two-dimensional grid of pixel objects. And again, there are things you can do to that image. You can make a new AP image. You can get the width and height. You can get a particular pixel object at a particular coordinate spot. You can set a particular coordinate position to have a new pixel. You can uh, draw or render the image. You can clone the image. You can uh, convert the image to a string that you could print out uh, in some kind of string representation. And uh, you can save the image as well. Uh, save it with the same name or save it with another name. Before we do any more interesting or more complex algorithms, let's actually just try out the images package and make sure that we understand at a basic level how it's working. Um, so this version of the images package only accepts .png files. That's using a, a modification that I made to it. Uh, the purpose being that we want lossless compression. Um, now, any images that you want to work with, we assume that they're stored in the working directory of your Eclipse project, which really just means in that highest level, which contains SRC. So it, any images you want to work with should be at the same level as SRC. Now let's take a look at a really simple program that basically just loads a single image. So we have our import statement at the top, importing the AP image class from the images package. If we wanted, we could also do import images.star, and that would give us everything in the, image, in the images package. Then we make a new class. Okay, this class is called test draw. We have a main method. Inside that main method, we instantiate and declare a new AP image object. And here, the input that this method takes when we create the new object is a file name and it's assumed to be in the working directory so here we're going to be loading up the file winbaby.png then we can draw that image that we just made that image object by calling the draw method image.draw and uh, we'll see in a second that that'll trigger the actual window for us to see the image and then we end main we end test draw so let's see it in action uh, this is the exact same code uh, if i just go ahead and click run right now well how about that the image popped up. Okay, We created a new AP image. This one was called image. It took in a file, winbaby.png, and then it drew that file for us. It rendered the file for us. Okay, so now we're ready to talk a little more about object-based programming. And really, that just means using existing classes and objects and methods uh, to solve problems. Okay, and oftentimes, it's, it's code that someone else has written. So if you want to use an object properly, right, you have to know what methods it recognizes, what it can actually do, and how to call those methods. And if we gather all those methods into one place, right, we call that the, the object's interface. We saw just a little while ago the interfaces of the pixel class and the AP image class. Right? We saw the methods that they can do, uh, we, the, what, the methods are, what the methods are called, what inputs they take, what parameters they take, and descriptions of what they actually do. We also saw the return types. Here we have the interface for the AP image class. You can see what the main things in a class's interface are. Right? What's the method call? What does it take in? What's its, what are its parameters if it takes any? Uh, what does it give back if it gives back anything? And just a few comments on what they actually do. And we don't really care at the interface level about how a method does its job. But we just care about what's the input it expects and what's the output it's going to give me. When I gather together all the interfaces in a package or in a language, 
we call that the application programming interface or the API. So you can see uh, between these two uncharacteristically attractive programmers, an API is what allows them to use each other's code properly. So for instance, this guy on the right, uh, he can refer to the code written by the person on the left using the interface because he knows he can trust the inputs and outputs from it because those are exactly specified. That's an API. You could also think of it as a sort of contract between uh, somebody who wrote some code and somebody who's using someone else's code. Uh, essentially, it's saying, hey, I wrote a method. If you give me this input and you call my methods in this particular way, I'll do this thing for you and you can trust that. You can bank on it. Now, if you look at the interface for the pixel class, well, some of them have a void return type. We've seen this before. And in fact, basically all the methods we've written so far have had void return types. It just means that it doesn't return a value. If you remember the meat grinder metaphor, it means that there's no output value. So often we're gonna use methods that have no return type, that don't spit out a value for us at the end. We'll use them to actually modify the internal contents of an object. So uh, for that reason, we often call them mutators or setters that's what they're doing to uh, to the contents of the object so here is an example set red set green and set blue well those methods take one input they take a new integer red value or green value or blue value and they change whatever pixel we're using those methods on they change that pixels red value for set red or they change the pixels green value for set green or the blue value for set blue to whatever input we pass in and that way we could actually change the color of that particular pixel Okay, so we're mutating or we're setting the pixel values, uh, the, the colors for each pixel. So that was how we would set information about an object using a setter or a mutator. If we wanted to get information about uh, an object or access it, we'd use an accessor or a getter. Okay, that's a method that usually does return a value. So in this case, we have some getters that return uh, int, right? Get red, get green, get blue. They give us the particular color value of a, of a single pixel. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but clone returns actually an entire pixel object. It doesn't just return an int for one of its colors, it returns a whole pixel object which contains three colors. Okay. And uh, finally, we also have a toString method which returns a string. It's basically just a way for us to represent an object as a string. So if I had to print it out, what would I print? Again, we'll talk more about that as well. Last type of thing we'll look at are constructors. And constructors are a special type of method. You only call it a single time for a particular object. Okay, they always have the same name as the class and they don't have a return type. Okay, so we don't write void constructor and we don't write int or pixel or string constructor. We just write the name of the class and that's the name of the method, it's a constructor. Basically, it makes a new object. It instantiates a new object for us. Now, some constructors can take information as parameters. Some constructors don't. They don't take any parameters at all. So as an example, the pixel constructor that we can see here, it takes three parameters, three arguments, okay? A red, a green, and a blue value. So if we were making a new pixel, we might create it like this. Pixel, this pixel equals new pixel, 72, 193, 4. This makes sense, right? We've been doing this the entire time. We just didn't know that this was actually called a constructor, that this was a method. Okay, so now we know this thing on the right, when we instantiate the new object, we're calling a particular method that's defined. It's called a constructor, and it's only called a single time for a particular object. That constructor that we just saw for pixel took three parameters. It took a red value, a green value, and a blue value, all integers. Okay, whenever a constructor doesn't have any parameters, we call that the default constructor. Okay, and if it's, it's not specified, it's, it's, it's called the default constructor because if we don't include it, uh, the compiler includes it for us automatically for any class that is that, that's defined. So basically, if you call the default constructor, you'll end up with a set of default values for the contents of the object. Okay, so you won't specify a particular red, green, and blue value. You'll get whatever is chosen by default. All right, once you've actually created an image, you can take a look at its width and height using the methods get width and get height. So take a look at this code segment. We're printing the string width and then uh, image.getWidth. So if I have an AP image called image, right, I can get its width and print that out. Likewise, I can do the same with height, and that's going to print out 300, 225 in the case of uh, some arbitrary image. Now, if I wanted to, I could also print out the image's string representation. And the way that works is whoever writes the toString method in a particular class, they'll define how do you actually want to represent this object in a string. 
So it looks like the person who wrote this class, the AP Images class, decided that if I want to print out a, an, an image, that really means I want to print out what are its file name, its width, and its height. Those are the important things to print out. So that's what exists in the toString method. You can imagine that there are probably three print statements written in that method. Okay, so if I call image.toString and I print that out, that's going to print out this, this uh, set of text. Now remember, the toString method returns a string. So it makes sense that we can pass that into system.out.print. We're printing the string that is returned by image.toString. Now this is an interesting little thing. If I were to actually pass print or print line an object as a parameter, okay, so not image.toString, which returns a string, but, but a, a, a user-defined object like an image itself, we'll automatically call the toString method. So take a look at this example. If I just printed out not image.toString, but just image by itself, well, that ends up working just the same as image.toString. So we have a sort of implied toString there. Now let's get a little more complicated. We can also use the method setPixel to replace a red, green, blue color value at any given position in the image. So the next segment of code that we're about to look at basically draws a new 150 by 150 image, and it makes the default color black. And then the pixels along a horizontal line at the middle of the image, we replace them with a new red pixel. Right? Each of those pixels we replace with a red pixel, and the image gets redrawn. If you take a look here, you can see the before and after image. Okay, so let's take a look. We import AP image, we import pixel, and we actually import scanner as well. Okay, so we make a new scanner object. Now we're not gonna take any user input here in terms of text, but we'll see how we used our scanner object called reader shortly. Okay, we make a new AP image object uh, and we pass it. it. looks like this AP image constructor, if you take a look back at the interfaces from before, this AP image constructor takes two inputs, most likely a width and a height, uh, and uh, then we render that image. Now notice we haven't specified anything about uh, what the pixels in the image should look like by default, so those defaults are chosen for us, and it looks like by default they're chosen to be black, 0, 0, 0 for red, green, and blue. Okay, so that's the default, uh, the, the default look of these pixels when we create a new AP image that is 150 pixels by 150 pixels. Remember, an AP image is a grid of pixels. Okay, so we draw that image and we end up with this right here. Then we declare a new integer called y, and we say y is half of the image's height. Half of the image's height. So essentially, we're going halfway down the image. That's what y is. And then we have a for loop. Okay, so from x starting at 0, while x is less than or equal to the width, we are going to set the pixel at x, y, set the pixel at x, y, to an entirely new pixel. Here you can see we're instantiating an entirely new pixel object, a okay, brand new one. And this new pixel object has the RGB value 25500, which means it has full red, no green, and no blue. Great. So we've gone through and we've set every pixel in that middle row at X, Y to completely be red. Then we say, okay, uh, press return to continue, and we wait using reader.nextline for the user to press return. Now notice, this is interesting, right? We're, we're, we're not actually storing what next line takes in into a string. We're just using it to sort of delay the program until the user hits enter and we can move on. And finally, when they hit enter, we redraw the image and now we display this version of it. So up until now, we were still displaying the prior version of it. And after we call image.draw again, we update to reflect the changes that we made to all of these pixels. So this is the key thing, right? We've, we've, we're setting the pixel at a particular location in our AP image object with a new pixel an entirely new pixel object. It's like we're swapping out pixel objects. Now we could have done this in a slightly different way. We could have modified any of the RGB values within an existing pixel object instead of just replacing these pixel objects with brand new pixel objects, right? So we could have modified each pixel rather than just replacing it with a new one. Okay, and here's what that would look like, all right? In that for loop, Instead of creating an entirely new pixel object, which we can see we did originally using this new keyword in the constructor, well, all we do is we say, okay, let's make a pixel variable called p and let's point it at the current pixel, right? So we're taking the image and we're getting the current pixel at x, y. Then we use the set red method to set that red value to 255. And if you remember, when we created this AP image, 
all of the values, red, green, and blue, were set to zero by default. So we actually don't even need to set the green and blue values here. They're already zero for us. But if you wanted to be safe, you could also include p.set green zero and p.set blue zero. Not necessary here because of the way the default constructor works for pixel objects. So let's see this run real quick. I've clicked run on this program, test blank, uh, and it's now it's asking me to hit return to continue. I will hit return. Bingo, I'm shown the new object, the new image, uh, after it's been redrawn, this time with that red stripe halfway down. Perfect. Now, suppose I want to change all the pixels in an image by converting them to grayscale. Okay, so uh, using a pair of count-controlled loops, I could just move through each pixel in each row and, I, and, and do this, right? I could, uh, just like the pseudocode algorithm that we discussed in the last lecture. But there's actually an easier and more efficient way to do it. Okay, Java includes a loop statement called an enhanced for loop, okay? And sometimes it's called a for each loop, okay? So this enhanced for loop does this really easily for us. Basically, this type of loop assumes that you just want to visit all the elements of some data structure to do something, and you don't need to know their positions in the structure. All you want to do is go to each element and do something to it, okay? So this code segment uses this type of loop to convert an image to grayscale. We can see how it looks uh, for each pixel in this image, right, the image is an object of type AP image. So for each pixel in this image, call it P, get its red, green, and blue values, and set them to have integer variables called red, green, and blue. Create an integer called average, where you calculate the average value of the red, green, and blue values, and then set the red, green, and blue values to that average, so that they're all the same. Okay, this is a nice use of the for each loop. And you can see we don't need any counters here because we don't really care what the position is. We're going to every element in this image. We're going to every pixel in this image and we're doing the same thing. Don't need to know x and y. All we need to know is that we can take that pixel, the current pixel, and get its values, calculate an average, and set the values after that. So to generalize an enhanced for loop or a for each loop, it looks like this. For each element type name, we'll call it name, and go through the entire data structure for each one of those do these things. So you can see this is the element type. This is what we're calling each element every time we go through the loop. This is the data structure we're going through. It's an AP image called image, and these are the things we want to do. So on each pass through the loop, basically this loop variable is going to pick up the value of the next available element in the data structure, whatever is next. And you can use that value in the body of the loop. So in our case, we're calling it P. You don't have to make any assumptions about the order that you visit the elements in. You just trust that it's going to work. Okay. Now, this works with items called collections. We're not going to talk about that again for a while. But for now, you can trust that this works properly with AP images. Enhanced for loops are often easier to read, and they're easier to write than a regular for loop that has to use numerical positions. All I have to do is get the syntax right, and uh, the, the loop's going to work correctly. So, you know, fortunately for us, for a lot of the image processing alg algorithms that we're doing, that's all we need to do. Another easy transformation we can go through is to convert a color image to black and white. So this is different from making a grayscale image. Okay, a grayscale image uh, sends all the pixels to grayscale values, 000, 111, 222, all the way up to 255, 255, 255. And we end up with these shades of gray. But when I say a black and white image, what I mean is literally an image where every pixel is either completely black or completely white. And you'll see that you'll use this actually in problem set 5. For each pixel, this algorithm computes the average of the red, green, and blue values. Okay, and then we reset the pixel's RGB values either to 0, which is black, if the average is closer to 0, or to 255, white, if the average is closer to 255. So let's look at some Java code for this algorithm, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll look at an example as well. And right here we have the wind baby in color and the wind baby in black and white. So uh, we make a new scanner. And again, that scanner is not to really take user input that we're going to use, but just to, uh, just to capture whether the user is ready to move on or not. Okay, we make a new AP image called wind baby and we render that image. So initially, this is the only image that shows. Then we're going through each pixel in the image, calling it P getting its red, green, and blue values, storing them into integer variables called red, green, and blue. Because remember, get read, because remember, get red, get green, and get blue all return ints. We calculate an average value for the pixel. And then we're saying, we know that this average value is somewhere between 0 and 255. 
So if it's greater than 127, we're saying, hey, it's actually closer to white. Remember, white is 255, 255, 255 for RGB, whereas black is 000 for RGB. So if the average is greater than 127, if it's closer to white, then set red, green, and blue for that pixel, for that particular pixel, to 255, 255, 255. Otherwise, we know that we're actually closer to black, so set the entire pixel, all three values, to zero, and that way that pixel turns black. Then we prompt the user to continue. We say, okay, uh, press return to continue. As soon as they hit enter, uh, we'll go on, and then the new image will be drawn. Okay. Now, it's actually the same image object, but pixel values have been changed. Right? They've all been changed to either white or black. We draw the new image, and uh, then we prompt the user one more time, enter Y to save the output image. So then we say if reader.nextline.equals ignore case Y. So now we're waiting for them to enter something. If they enter the value Y, the string Y, then we'll prompt them with the save as box, and we can save that image with a new name. Right? We can save uh, this black and white version using the regular save file dialog. So let's see this one in action. I've clicked run, win baby pops up, and it says press return to continue. So let me hit return. Perfect, I've got win baby. Now it's the black and white version. That whole algorithm ran. And now it's prompting me again, enter Y to save the output image. Now if I enter anything but Y, uh, the program will just terminate. We won't enter that if statement. But let me see what happens if I click Y. Yes, fantastic. Well, it popped up on my other screen, so let me drag it over. Great. Now the save as dialog pops up. I will probably want to navigate to wherever I wanted to save this, and then I'll save it as a file. Now you want to make sure you include the .png file extension. So if I wanted to call this, say, WinBaby BW for WinBaby Black and White, I'll make sure to include the .png file extension here. Great. Couple things before you close up shop. Okay, you, you want to be able to define in English what an AP image and a pixel are. Uh, what are the pieces of each? What are their structure? What do they look like? What, are, what do they mean? Um, you want to prepare the images package to use. This is really important. You're going to use it on problem set 5, and uh, you got to be able to uh, actually have it run on your machine. You want to be able to instantiate and display a new AP image object that takes a, a width and a height as initial arguments. Uh, use getters and setters. Tell me what a getter and setter is. Tell me what a constructor is, too. Tell me uh, the algorithm for turning a color image to grayscale pixel by pixel, uh, just like we looked at last lecture, but now you can actually think about it in Java specifically. And finally, you want to be able to iterate through an image using an enhanced for loop, especially as we just saw uh, to convert an image to black and white.